After receiving several comments on my last video where I talked about the dangers of over fertilizing with too much organic matter, I decided to do a follow up video to give some more examples, talk more about the importance of soil testing, and give a brief PSA on another potential danger from amino perilid herbicides. So if you haven't seen that last video, you can check it out with the link below. And I'd like to say thank you to everyone who left a comment on that video and brought up some important details that I think are worth some discussion. All right, first let's talk about aminoperilid herbicides so we can kind of get that out of the way. So uh, I'm very thankful that one of my viewers mentioned this because I had not heard of it uh, before they brought it up. So if you have not heard of these either, uh, there's a great video from Charles Dowding where he explains it all in detail and shows some examples. So I'll leave a link to that down below. But basically, aminoperilid herbicides are indirectly causing severe damage to farms and gardens all over the world, uh, whereas most herbicides break down fairly quickly in the soil this particular chemical compound can last significantly longer until it's broken down by soil bacteria. So it's typically used to kill everything but the grass in grazing pastures, but the residue remains and it goes through the animal's digestion, winds up in the manure, and even if that manure sits for many years and, and ages and then it's used as a soil fertilizer, that herbicide can still be in there and it winds up causing severe plant health issues. So the viewer who mentioned this was concerned that maybe that herbicide had been present in the municipal compost that we used for these beds. And that is a legitimate concern because that compost is produced from the organic waste that's collected from all over the city and it is possible that that herbicide could have been used somewhere would have made its way into the compost at the facility and it can even survive through the very intense heat of the composting process over an entire year and it will wind up in the finished compost and get into your soil if you use it so Yes, that it is possible that could have happened, but at this point I'm quite confident that it didn't appear to be in there because this chemical is designed to attack uh, broadleaf species, uh, weedy species, in the field so that it leaves only the grass. And if it gets into your garden soil, then it will affect uh, tomatoes, beans, and lettuce, and peppers, and others and we haven't seen symptoms on any of those. The legumes, the beans, peas, and clover seem to suffer the worst damage. They, the new growth gets very curled and deformed, and so the plant suffers stunted growth. It's not able to uh, flower very much or produce a good harvest. And you can see more examples of this in Charles Downing's video. So I'm happy to report that the legumes have actually been probably the healthiest crops that we have grown in these beds since we put them together. And that's partly because legumes are a nitrogen fixer, so they have some help there. But they are also a very low nutrient demand crop, so they aren't as affected by any uh, toxic nutrients. So we haven't seen any symptoms on the legumes. In fact, uh, the pole beans were probably the, the best crop that we grew this year. This is just one bowl of dozens like this that we harvested throughout the summer. Uh, as another example, we have some red clover growing in this bed after we had some garlic here, trying to get this fertilized a little again. And aside from being totally munched by rabbits and experiencing some cold weather, it looks fine. And we also have this same crop growing in our hugel culture beds and it looks the same over there too. So I am quite certain at this point that we do not have aminoperilid herbicides in this municipal compost that we used here. 
And I'm still thankful that my viewer mentioned this because I wasn't aware of it. And I think everybody should be aware of it. So I think I may do more, a more extensive video about it in the spring just to help spread the word. So now let's get back to nutrient toxicity in your soil because I am more certain than ever that that is the cause of a lot of our plant health issues here. So in a stroke of perfect timing, there was a peer-reviewed article just published in which authors Linda Chalker Scott and James Downer break down six common myths about soil health management specifically in a home garden and landscape setting. So there's a lot of great info in that article, so I'll leave a link to that down below as well. But I would like to go over a few key points that they make in that article, specifically about organic matter and soil nutrition. Based on decades of research on both crop and ornamental species, scientists have determined optimal levels of macro and micronutrients required for normal plant growth. While nutrient deficiencies can be common in intensive agricultural production, nutrient toxicities are unusual and as a result have received little research attention until recently. The relatively young field of urban soils research has begun to document the occurrence of nutrient toxicities as a result of improper fertilizer use and or organic material additions. Phosphate toxicity is perhaps the best example of this phenomenon, but excessive levels of other nutrients, such as calcium and magnesium, are also commonly seen in garden and landscape soil tests, possibly due to underlying soil conditions or the improper use of gypsum and epsom salts, respectively. If you remember from that last video, I had some help from the Facebook group, The Garden Professors, of which Linda Chalker Scott is one of the main administrators and contributors. So I had shared our soil test results with that group and they helped to point out that excessive phosphorus in the soil was likely inhibiting plants from being able to take up other important micronutrients. I did, however, forget to mention that uh, excessive phosphorus can also inhibit plants from forming associations with mycorrhizal fungal networks in the soil. And this is a crucial point because mycorrhizal fungi basically create an extension of the root system of the plants and help to deliver even more water and nutrients to the plant. It's a beautiful symbiotic relationship. So the vast majority of plant species on earth rely on that association with fungi to help them not only survive but thrive and reproduce. So that is just one more severely damaging effect of excessive phosphorus in the soil. I will admit that I was wrong in that video to speak so generally about compost being so potentially harmful because I was basing that conclusion on our own bad experience using municipal compost which I can almost guarantee is going to be much more potent than any homemade compost. And some of my viewers mentioned that they usually grow in 100% or near 100% compost, and they have great results year after year. But that also brings up another good point. Of course, it was a bad idea for me to use so much municipal compost in these beds because that stuff is so loaded with nutrients. And anything you use at home is probably going to be more mild, but even so, excessive use of any kind of compost can eventually lead to nutrient toxicity. It may just take longer than it did for us. As I mentioned in that other video, not all organic matter is the same. And this is also shown in the above mentioned article with two examples. One, where there is a typical percentage of organic matter, but excessive nutrients, the other is with a higher percentage of organic matter, but mostly optimal nutrients. And this shows that organic materials release nutrients at different rates as they break down. So for example, compost is already decomposed and is packed with nutrients that get into the soil very quickly, whereas wood chips still need to be broken down over time, so they will release those nutrients much more slowly. So it's all about finding that balance between organic matter and soil nutrients, and the best way to do that is with regular soil testing. 
The most accurate way to learn about your soil is by sending samples to a lab at a university or a laboratory that specializes in agricultural and home soil testing. So I wouldn't recommend using any of the home test kits that you can get because they are notoriously unreliable. And besides, you can often get for the same cost as one of those kits, uh, a much better, more detailed test done and maybe even for free aside from paying for shipping. So if you have been testing your soil regularly and you can see that it does need nutrients each year to replace the nutrients that are being taken up by your plants, then that's great and keep doing that. But if you haven't been testing your soil and you're continuing to add nutrient-rich organic matter year after year, you could be headed for the same kind of toxic nutrient problems that we're having here. Everything may look good on the surface, but if you don't know what is in the soil, you may unnecessarily be adding more nutrients and creating eventually a toxic soil environment. So I strongly recommend testing your soil on an annual or biannual basis and use caution with how much and what type of organic matter you're using to fertilize your soil. Take the time to learn what's in your soil already so you can properly add nutrients if needed to replace what's being taken up by your plants. And again, there's a lot more information in that article, including such myths as changing your soil pH and using Epsom salts in the garden. So be sure to check that out. And thank you very much for watching. Be sure to hit that like button if you found anything useful in this video, and please consider subscribing to some room to grow if you haven't already. Stay safe and I'll see you next time.